uh, it's really, really wonderful to uh, be here. Um, uh, and I have to say that in, uh, not just in my view, certainly in my view, uh, um, uh, the, the project of uh, 100 kilometer circular colliders as Higgs factories and 100 TV colliders ultimately is certainly the most, clearly the most important um, uh, part of the experimental program in fundamental physics that uh, at least I can imagine on the sort of 50 year time scale. Um, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here to uh, at least share my own perspective for why, why this is true. And <clears throat> there's a bit of a cognitive dissonance in this entire subject. I'm sure many of you, certainly those of you who are in, uh, uh, who are in, the, in the trenches of uh, particle physics have felt it. Um, there are some people, like probably the majority of you in this room, uh, who think this is one of the most amazing times in the history of uh, fundamental physics. Um, there's really exciting and important things going on. And there are other people who are wandering around with their heads hung low, and they're saying, oh my gosh, it's all over. We haven't seen anything but the Hagues. Uh, if we don't see other things, you know, we might as well pack our bags and go home. Who's right? <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, um, uh, we can't both be right. <laughs> Uh, but in fact, we can kind of both be right, uh, because it depends on what you think is actually the point of doing um, uh, fundamental physics, what the point is of doing particle physics. If you think the point of doing particle physics is to discover new particles, then uh, you might as well take your ball and go home right now. Okay? There's absolutely no guarantee that there's any new particles to be seen anywhere be between here and, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, incredibly high energies close to the uh, uh, Planck scale. So if that's the point, if that's what drove you, if that's what you thought was going to happen, maybe with some tiny chance you'd go to Stockholm with a plot with a giant bump in it, then forget it. We don't know that's going to happen. Okay? We cannot guarantee that that's going to happen. However, I would say, uh, certainly this is what I think, um, that's not the absolute deepest aspect of what's going on in the fundamental physics. And in fact, uh, the very deepest aspects of our subject have not always been associated with plots like that and trips like that. Um, and that's what I would like to uh, uh, tell you about today. So uh, from my point of view, uh, how, do I, how do I move this forward here? Which button do I push? Green button? Ah, good. Uh, it all boils down, you see, from, from, from my point of view, uh, and again, not just my point of view. What's fundamental about, what's important about particle physics is not the particles per se, but the study of the fundamental laws of nature as governed by uh, the still largely mysterious union of space-time and quantum mechanics. And those were the two big revolutions of the first part of the 20th century. And those are the things that we still don't very deeply understand today. And in fact, the issues that have been raised by the discoveries made at the LHC uh, seeing the Higgs particle, of course, triumphantly um, uh, 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 in, on July 4th, 2012, and, uh, and everything which has happened since, which is not seeing other particles that, uh, that should have come along uh, for the ride with the Higgs from what many theorists expected for four decades. These are all things that heighten a certain tension that has to do with this overlap between these fundamental principles of, uh, of space-time and quantum mechanics. And that's what I'd like to uh, explain. Um, in this talk. So you're probably going to see in the rest of this week many more detailed plots and reaches and uh, things like that. So I want to actually back up and just explain to you in as clean and clear and simple a way as possible what the drama is that is at stake and, uh, and why, why I think this uh, experimental program is so crucial. So let's begin with a very simple question. What is particle physics? And um, Maybe many of you don't uh, realize this, but the very name, the very, the, it's built in to the, uh, uh, to the subject, uh, has to do with the notions of space-time and quantum mechanics. Before asking what's particle physics, we should ask what is a particle. Uh, and what is a particle has everything to do with space-time and quantum mechanics. So what is a particle? Um, well, the most naively, a particle is a little blob of mass or energy that can sort of uh, move around without changing its, uh, uh, without dispersing too much. But a little bit more fundamentally than that, um, uh, there are two important notions. One of them is that uh, why do we give, 
why do we say that what, we have an electron here, and we give it the same name, electron, here, and the same name, electron, there? That's because the world has a symmetry of translational invariance. Okay? And so the property of what we mean, even the name that we give the particle, the fact that we give it the same name from place to place to place, is reflecting uh, one of the symmetries of space and time. Why do we call an electron moving this way an electron and also give it the same name when it's moving that way and moving that way? It's because of rotational invariance. Okay? So uh, even, so, uh, so the first basic uh, fact of life is that we have these space-time symmetries of translations, rotations, and boosts, and uh, those dictate even the names that we give the elementary particles. Beyond that, uh, the world is uh, quantum mechanical, and so once we've decided that, uh, that, that we have an object that, for example, behaves nicely under translation, so that's, uh, uh, that's an eigenstate of momenta, then we can also ask what other kinds of possible labels it can have, and th these are um, observations going back to Eugene Wigner in the 1930s that, that tell us that what we should think of as a particle, something labeled not just by its momentum, but also by other possible quantum numbers, is something that carries a certain representation of the symmetries of space and time. So the technical way of saying it is that particles are, in fact, unitary representations of translations and Lorentz transformations, or the Poincaré symmetry. And so built into the very definition of what a particle is are these uh, notions of quantum mechanics and space time. So particle physics is the study of the fundamental laws of nature uh, governed by the still mysterious union of quantum mechanics and space time. And I'm emphasizing this over and over again. This is what's special about our field. We have H bar and C. We have quantum mechanics and space time. And those things are still not perfectly well understood. And as I said, uh, many of the deepest mysteries have to do with some aspect of the actually triumvirate of ideas involving quantum mechanics, space time, and the vacuum that we still don't understand. So, before highlighting what we don't understand and why the experimental program of 100 kilometer machines, Higgs factories, and 100 TV colliders are so central to the program of fundamental physics, let me spend five or seven minutes uh, reviewing where we've gotten to. Okay? And again, I want to review where we've gotten to in a way that makes the closeness of the phenomenon to the underlying fundamental principles of quantum mechanics and space-time as manifest as possible with no veil of fancy mathematical formalism or anything between the principles and the phenomenon. That's one of the real triumphs of the 20th century is this fact, and I want to present it in as clean a way uh, as I can. So the march, in fact, of the last 400 years of fundamental physics can really be thought of as a march of reductionism and a march uh, of symmetries. Um, and, uh, and maybe the highlight of this, um, after the discovery of, of, of relativity and quantum mechanics in the uh, early part of the 20th century, is the following slogan that we can now say, and which has real teeth and has real meaning, which is the following. Um, there is an incredible rigidity that goes with these twin principles of relativity and quantum mechanics. And we can now say that whatever the ultimate theory of the world is, and we don't know what it is yet, but whatever it is, being compatible with the principles of space-time and the principles of quantum mechanics already tells us something remarkable. Whatever the underlying theory is, at long enough distances, it's guaranteed to be described by massless particles in some approximation interacting in the simplest possible way where three elementary particles meet at a point in space-time. Uh, the fact that we can reduce our discussion to thinking about massless particles is one aspect of reductionism. The fact, the, the idea that the basic principles are manifest at very short distances that quantum mechanics tells us corresponds to very high energies. So that's why in some zeroth order approximation it's sensible to neglect all the particle masses. Uh, uh, and the fact that the, that, that the fundamental interactions uh, involve three particles meeting at a point in space-time, and the nature of those interactions are almost completely dictated by, by symmetry. And the incredible thing is when you put these two principles together and you give sufficiently competent theoretical physicists food and graduate students and so on and tell them to go in a room and think what a universe could look like compatible with these principles, they'll come back and tell you that it's incredibly rigid. It's almost impossible. And if you're going to make it happen, 
uh, the only spins for these massless particles that you're allowed to have are spin 0, 1 half, 1, 3 halves, and 2. That this 2 guy is very special, for example. It's totally unique. You can only have one of them. It has to have universal interactions. It makes massive particles go around in orbits. It's gravity, but uh, you don't need anything other than sort of pure thought after you know these deep principles of relativity and quantum mechanics to be able to deduce its existence as one of the consistent possibilities. And, um, and anyway, so there's a very rigid and small set of principles, uh, small set of elementary particles and interactions that are allowed. Let me give you a flavor of the kind of argument that uh, goes into this. Um, you don't have to uh, understand any of this in detail. This is uh, just uh, um, uh, somewhat impressionistic for those of you who haven't seen this before. Oh, what happened here? OK, here we, here we go. Um, so uh, remember, we're focusing on the dynamics of uh, massless particles. And, uh, and it turns out that just in order to describe the momenta of massless particles, there's a very convenient set of uh, uh, spinorial variables to, uh, to a do it. So, um, so if you imagine just talking about the four momenta of a massless particle, so it has an energy component, P0, P1, P2, and P3, you can group them into a two by two matrix that's sort of familiar from undergraduate quantum mechanics using poly matrices. And the fact that the particle is massless tells you that the determinant of this matrix is zero, so you can write it as the outer product of two two-dimensional vectors. And that greatly simplifies talking about uh, this. Uh, uh, that greatly simplifies talking about this physics. When you then imagine what happens when three particles meet at a point in space-time, and that's the simplest possible interaction that you could imagine, where three points particles move uh, uh, meet at one point in space-time, then this can happen in only two ways, where these uh, uh, two-dimensional vectors, either one kind or the other kind, are parallel to each other. Uh, and remarkably, it turns out that the nature of that interaction, you've never heard of anything, no one has uh, taught you a uh, you know, graduate course in quantum field theory, you're not thinking about Lagrangians or anything like that. There's no formalism involved here. You're just following your nose and writing down the only thing you can compatible with the, uh, with the symmetries of relativity. It, it turns out once you specify the spins or the helicities of these massless particles, it's completely specified. Up to the strength of the, this interaction, it's completely specified by Poincaré symmetry. Okay, so that tells you that, uh, that directly from the symmetries of space-time, the leading kind of interactions elementary particles can have are nailed. There's nothing you can, you can do about it. All right? Next, let's say we're talking about spin-1 particles, just for fun. Okay, so we're talking about massless spin-1 particles. Let's say I have a whole bunch of them that I'm, uh, I'm just going to label uh, I'm just going to label them with labels A, B, and C. If I have 10 of them, these labels, let's say, would go from 1 to 10. Then, if you just take these rules into account, exactly the formulas I told you before tells you you have uh, some expression that looks like this. Um, and now you have to input some information from quantum mechanics. That if you have a, now not just a, a, a three particle process, but a four particle process, that this four particle process has an opportunity to blow up or develop a pole when you can actually produce an intermediate uh, guy, um, uh, a particle that used to be virtual and make it real. And quantum mechanics dictates that, that when that happens, this, the amplitude for this process should factorize into the, into the product of the two pieces for making the intermediate particle and having the intermediate particle decay out to the other end. So on the previous slide, we had space time on this, uh, on this slide, we have quantum mechanics and unitarity. And that ends up telling you that those constants have to be very, very special. They have to satisfy exactly the identities that allow us to infer that this system must be described by a gauge theory. And once again, it has nothing to do with beauty and elegance. And you might think there are 15,000 other ways of doing it. No, there is one way of doing it. And there's no, other, there's no uh, alternatives. Uh, it's just nailed by these requirements of space-time and quantum mechanics. OK, so and that's, that's the general story. That's the general story uh, that leads to this remarkable uh, conclusion that whatever the underlying theory is, if you're talking about massless particles, then, at, uh, then uh, at, at, at some leading order in their interaction, this is the only set of menu of possibilities that we're allowed to talk about. 
All right, but now what about masses? We know that particles have masses, and here there's a, there's a famous story uh, that uh, when you have particles that have mass, your most naive expectation is that as you go to very high energies, you can ignore the masses of the particles. But here again, relativity <laughs> rears its head in an interesting way. There is a qualitative difference between uh, a massive particle and a massless particle when that particle has spin. If you have a massive spin one particle, like a W or a Z boson, however, it's, uh, however quickly it's moving, you can always catch up with it and go to a frame where it's at rest. And however it's spinning, by tilting your head, you can see it spinning in three different directions. So a massive spin one particle has three degrees of freedom, whereas a massless spin one particle, like a photon, only has two degrees of freedom because you can never catch up with it. Okay? And that very basic fact that two is not equal to three is at the heart of some of al almost all the drama of theoretical physics in the 20th century is about that fact that two is not equal to three for uh, the difference between massless and massive when it comes to spin one particles. And two is not equal to five when it comes to the difference between massless and massive for spin two particles and so on. Okay? So, uh, so it's not trivial to have mass. You have extra degrees of freedom, and uh, you have to be able to smoothly interpolate between the world of massive particles at low energies and massless particles at high energies. And just by counting on your fingers, you find that you can't do it unless you have something else. And famously, that's something else. Uh, the simplest possible thing that something else could be in the context of the massive particles we know of in nature uh, if you just took the mass of particles we knew about before July 4th, 2012, just by counting on your fingers, you could see that it was impossible to take the things that we saw and reorganize them into consistent massless particles interactions at very high energies. And all it took was one single solitary degree of freedom, the Higgs particle, to allow us to do that. So the story of the Higgs then is an is is the correction to this picture that when everything is massless, it's totally determined by grand principles. And now when particles are massive, something has got to allow us to smoothly interpolate between massive at low energies and massless at high energies. And the incredible thing is that just one particle, single particle, was all it took to uh, do that. So now, now we have a smooth story that lets us uh, understand the gross properties of everything we see in the universe around us, starting from incredibly basic fundamental principles of, uh, of uh, relativity and quantum mechanics. All right, so uh, what are some of the lessons of this? Well, one lesson for a theorist is that the belief in principles paid off. So we had these basic principles. We had, uh, we had these basic principles that completely fix the properties of, the, uh, of particles in the massless limit. And we had to figure out some way of interpolating between massive at low energies and massless at high energies. And there aren't 15,000 things you can do. In fact, all we, all we had way, way back when, uh, all we knew was that this is all we are allowed. Particles of spin 0, half, 1, 3 halves, and 2. And what nature had taken advantage of as far as we knew was particles of spin a half, like the electron, spin 1, like the, like the photons and the gluons and the Ws and Zs, and spin 2, the graviton. But we had never seen the elementary particles of spin zero, nor elementary particles of spin three halves. So that's the constrained life of the theoretical physicist. You have to figure out how to solve puzzles within a very, very constrained theoretical framework. And the amazing thing is that uh, this, we saw the first really new kind of elementary particle we've seen in 50 years. What allowed us to do it was uh, to make that uh, to, to take advantage of this possibility that we'd never seen before of an elementary particle of spin zero. This leaves a single thing left over that nature, that we have not seen nature do that's compatible with its grand principles, which is to take advantage of the possibility of having massless particles of spin three halves. This is a possibility that's associated with supersymmetry, something I won't say anything about uh, for the rest of this talk, but just, just emphasize this is the reason, the dominant reason most theoretical physicists find this idea interesting is because we've seen nature take advantage of everything it can do, and that's the last thing that it can do that we have not yet seen it do. So it's, uh, if for that reason alone, it's, it's worth uh, uh, looking for. All right, so that's the summary of where we are. So, uh, but. I've said a number of times that we seem to be at one of those points that comes along in the history of physics every 100 years or so where something very large and structural is at stake in our understanding of nature. So what are the indications for that? 
Well, there are these indications for 21st century revolutions. And they all have to do with the fact that these two principles of space-time and quantum mechanics, while being spectacularly successful and restrictive uh, um, uh, in, our, in, in uh, describing nature, that there are very good reasons to believe that they're approximate. At least one, or perhaps both of these ideas might end up being approximate. And I'll, I'll talk uh, a little bit more about, uh, uh, the, about the aspect that has to do with the doom of space-time um, and emphasize its relationship to the end of reductionism. So uh, we have lots of good indications, uh, theoretical indications, that, that the idea of space-time is approximate. And going along with it, the entire reductionist paradigm that's driven, uh, that's driven fundamental physics for uh, 400 years is essentially false. Um, and we also have another a large set of challenges that might end up being related to the first set of ideas to, uh, to try to give a simple understanding to a, very, uh, uh, to a very basic question. Why is the universe big? Maybe it's the, most, uh, it's the most obvious feature of the universe around us is it's large, even though it's made out of small things. And even though the laws that govern it hold sway on microscopic distances, but it's, it's paradoxical that the universe is big because these very quantum mechanical laws that are otherwise spectacularly successful would lead you to, to suspect more and more violent quantum mechanical fluctuations at shorter and shorter distances that would seem to want to destroy any macroscopic order we see in the universe around us. So I'm going to explain, uh, I'm going to explain these, these points in a second, but I want to highlight that it's clear that really new ideas are needed uh, that are likely to go beyond the paradigms of space-time and internal symmetries. So first, let me explain uh, this uh, business about the end of reductionism and the end of space-time and so on. Um, yet another aspect of this is a slogan that the deep ultraviolet starts turning into the deep infrared again. Um, because of quantum mechanics and gravity. So um, imagine, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's uh, not worry about the, about the practical uh, details of life in the 21st century where we're struggling to get to 100 TV. Uh, imagine that you had some, uh, some experimentalist in the 32nd century uh, who has a, a Planck scale accelerator, right? They've finally managed to get to the Planck scale and they're colliding particles at around the uh, Planck scale. Now, we have this idea that we go to higher energies to probe shorter distances. But eventually, something very bad happens. Eventually, uh, uh, as, you, as you pile so much energy into such a tiny region of space, uh, because of gravity, that region is, uh, gravitates. And you put so much energy into su such a tiny region of space that you actually collapse the region that you're looking at into a black hole. And that makes it impossible to see what's going on in there. And let's say you get frustrated and build an even bigger accelerator, what happens? You make an even bigger black hole. Okay? It makes it even harder to see what's going on inside. So this, so this very basic thought experiment tells you the, the entire picture that super duper high energies, the super duper short distances, that the universe is somehow fundamentally determined at the tiniest possible distances is basically wrong. First, the whole notion of space and time is breaking down at incredibly short distances. Secondly, uh, uh, if anything, as you go to ultra super high energy, you start probing very large distances again. Okay, so that's a very basic fact that has to do with the ex existence of quantum mechanics and gravity, but it has this startling consequence that this basic reductionist paradigm, if you're a technical quantum field theorist, it's associated with one of the giants of quantum field theory in the 20th century, Ken Wilson, so we call it the Wilsonian effective field theory paradigm. Um, this paradigm is false because of gravity. <laughs> Okay, it's basically false. It tells us that the fundamental laws of nature are nothing like that of condensed matter physics, ultimately. Um, this entire paradigm where we have a separation between the world and the laws is given at ultra short distances and some effective theory merging at long distances, this paradigm was born of very fruitful and profound analogies between particle physics and condensed matter physics. That analogy has limits, has very fundamental limits, and our universe is not like some random condensed matter system. The ideas are much deeper and more radical. Now, these things have been appreciated for a long time, but, it might, but you might think that, well, maybe these issues are relevant when you start making black holes and getting up to these Planckian energies or so on, but they're not, they're not necessarily relevant you know, directly above our head as we're exploring things in the neighborhood of the TV scale, a point that I'll come back to in a moment. Well, let's come back to this uh, second point. Why is there a macroscopic universe? Uh, well, 
Uh, there are many aspects of why there is a macroscopic universe. One of them is why do, we en why do we enjoy these enormous separations of scale between microscopic distances like the Planck length that we just talked about and macrophysics, right? And at a very basic level, um, we can ask, for example, why are the elementary particle masses so tiny compared to uh, uh, these uh, uh, Planckian energies? In fact, even before talking about why, why they're tiny, Let's ask an even more basic question. Um, why do we get to talk about particles like the photon being massless? Why is the photon massless? Uh, after all, the photon plowing through the vacuum has all these virtual uh, quantum mechanical fluctuations with electrons and more photons and very, very complicated things as it's moving through the vacuum. Um, we even think colloquially of the vacuum as some kind of medium. I mean, it's not like an ether. It's a Lorentz invariant medium. But still, uh, there's a sense in which the vacuum has all these properties. Why do these properties not endow the photon with a mass? It has these very complicated interactions as it's uh, uh, moving through, through the vacuum. Well, the reason is simple and deep. The photon does not have a mass because 2 is not equal to 3. Okay? Because if in any approximation, uh, you found yourself with a massless photon. Because the massless photon has two degrees of freedom and a massive one has three, little changes like these quantum mechanical corrections, uh, um, uh, virtual corrections with particles popping in and out of the vacuum, cannot give rise out of the blue to discontinuously to a third degree of freedom. So because two is not equal to three, that's the reason why the photon is massless. And this explains many things. This explains why a friendly condensed matter physics can engineer cool condensed matter systems that at large distances give rise to many of the uh, qualitative ingredients of the sort we see in the standard model. They can get things that look like massless gauge fields, chiral fermions. A lot of the things that we see in the standard model can be, I mean, it's not literally the standard model, of course, but the qualitative phenomenon can be engineered in interesting condensed matter systems. Why? Because the existence of, of massless objects with spin is, is reasonable in this way. It's robust. I can't discontinuously give them a mass because I can't make the number of degrees of freedom jump. Okay, that's what's different about the Higgs. This argument does not work for the Higgs, and that's what's special about the Higgs. The whole irony of the Higgs is that it's the simplest possible elementary particle we could imagine. It has almost no properties. It just has mass. It doesn't have spin. It doesn't have charge. It doesn't have anything other than mass. Okay? It's the simplest possible elementary particle. And that very simplicity is what makes it so theoretically per perplexing. You see, as the Higgs is wandering through the vacuum, if you make, try to make exactly the same argument for the Higgs as we made for the photon, you fail. It's a massless, it's a, it's a spin zero particle, and there is no difference between the number of degrees of freedom of a, of a, uh, of a massless and a massive spin zero particle. They both have one degree of freedom. There's absolutely no reason why the, uh, the interaction of the Higgs with all these virtual quantum mechanical fluctuations cannot give it an enormous mass. This is also why you cannot engineer in a state of nature or in any condensed matter system or anywhere else we've seen in any other phenomenon in nature something like the Higgs. Even though we've seen things like everything else that we've seen in the standard model, cousins of them in other parts of physics, the Higgs is totally special for this reason. This logic has worked elsewhere in physics, and it explains why you don't pick up hunks of material and see Higgs-like excitations in them, even though you can see the other kind of uh, uh, excitations in them relatively commonly. So this is an enormous irony, because this entire story that I told you about how space-time and quantum mechanics nails everything when particles are massless, and then we have this detail to worry about with mass. We have to get an extra degree of, extra degrees of freedom somehow. The Higgs is the simplest possible thing, one degree of freedom that allows us to interpolate between massive at low energies and massless at high energies. And that tells us why the mass of all the elementary particles has to be pegged to the mass of the Higgs. The enormous irony after all this spectacular progress is we don't understand where the mass of the Higgs itself came from. Okay. Um, uh, for this very simple reason, that uh, instead of 2 not equal to 3 uh, for, for photons and 2 not equal to 5 for gravitons, we have 1 equals 1 for the Higgs. And we simply do not understand. Uh, uh, we cannot compute. Uh, from first principles, theoretically, the origin of the mass of the Higgs. All right, uh, let me skip this slide. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll just say that there are many other ways of, uh, 
of seeing that, uh, that there is a problem, um, uh, of seeing exactly the same issue. Uh, one of them is to do a very simple estimate where you just look at the energy uh, in all the quantum mechanical uh, fluctuations. Every mode in the universe, you put the universe in an enormous box, every mode in the universe has a half h bar omega zero point energy from fermions and from bosons. And if you add that half h bar omega up, um, uh, zero point energy up for everything we know of in the universe, uh, you find two big surprises that there should be an enormous energy density in the vacuum. That's the cosmological constant problem. That enormous energy in density in the vacuum should curve the universe to, in, to very tiny sizes. Instead, we have this gigantic universe, sort of 10 billion uh, uh, light years across. Um, and just the subleading correction to this calculation would tell you that there should be an enormous inertia or mass generated for the Higgs, again, that we have not seen. Uh, and so these, this one little back of the envelope estimate, uh, which is all about why is the universe big, we see that we don't have a good understanding of why the universe is big. Violent quantum mechanical fluctuations at shorter and shorter distances would seem to totally destroy any kind of microscopic order that we could have. It's not an inconsistency with the theory. We can certainly accommodate the fact that the universe is big, but we don't have any first principle calculation that allows us to uh, just come up with a formula for the size of the universe or for the, uh, for the mass associated with the Higgs. So these issues uh, are one of many indications that we have to move beyond symmetries. So I just told you already that the issue uh, with the Higgs uh, is that we have one degree of freedom for the Higgs, regardless of whether the Higgs mass squared is slightly bigger than zero, equal to zero, or even slightly less than zero. There's no difference. That's exactly the hierarchy problem. The avatar of this phenomenon in cosmology, almost exactly the same words and issues are involved. Uh, we have exactly the same amount of symmetry in a universe that has either a positive, a zero, or a negative cosmological constant. There's nothing special about very small or zero cosmological constant. We simply have a universe that has either a de-sitter symmetry, flat space, or anti-de-sitter symmetry. And so these are both indications that the main workhorse we've had for uh, certainly the last 100 years, as, as the analytic continuation of the 300 that came before that, of symmetries as uh, simple explanations for the gross uh, features of the universe is now breaking down. And it's breaking down from the two great discoveries of the last, uh, of the last uh, 20, 30 years, the discovery of the accelerating universe and the discovery of the Higgs particle. So these are some of the dramas of the 21st century um, uh, uh, I've mentioned. Uh, there's the question of how space-time might emerge from more basic building blocks. Uh, there's the question of why there's a macroscopic universe, and these questions may be related to each other, but in any case, it's clear that we're missing something huge about the quantum mechanics of our relativistic vacuum. And I want to stress that the Higgs discovery is absolutely crucial, because it shows that our relativistic quantum vacuum is qualitatively different than anything we've seen anywhere in physics. Now, we already have these arguments that the breakdown of the Wilsonian picture and reductionism and all of this stuff had to hit us in the face at some point, but maybe it could be deferred all the way up to the Planck scale, where, where, where monsters be. Now we have, from what we've seen so far, we've seen the Higgs, we haven't seen anything else. We now see that we have more and more indication there's something wrong with this basic worldview already above our head, right where we are now, not just at the Planck scale, but already at the uh, uh, TeV scale. And in many ways, the Higgs is the most important character in this drama because we can put it under the most incisive and precise uh, experimental scrutiny. So uh, people ask all the time, um, if we don't see the Higgs, if we don't see anything, any, uh, anything on the Higgs, we don't see any new physics, we can't be guaranteed that future machines will see new physics. These, this language drives me bananas. <laughs> Uh, because, in fact, the Higgs itself is really new physics. It's much more profoundly new physics than had we just discovered this or that random other particle. Okay? Uh, there is some collection of people who would have been thrilled if we had not discovered the Higgs and discovered something like Technicolor or strong dynamics for electroweak symmetry breaking. That would have been perfectly great. It would have been another 40 years of repeating the exercises that we did as we discovered things about QCD. And it would not be remotely the paradigm-changing, amazing, you know, dramatic thing 
that we've gotten by just, quote unquote, just seeing the Higgs. Okay? Just, quote unquote, seeing the Higgs is the most surprising, shocking, sort of paradigm shifting thing that could have happened so far. Uh, a lot of theorists, maybe some experimentalists, wish that it wasn't quite so paradigm shifting, okay? But, uh, but uh, that's, that's what it is. I think the, uh, um, so, uh, and it's a harbinger of some profound new principles at work uh, in the quantum vacuum. So we have to look at it closely. And I'll just end quickly with these, uh, with what, what's, what's at stake. So the, the arguments for what we need to do are extremely simple. All the drama about the Higgs has to do with the fact that it appears to be an elementary spin zero particle, the first elementary spin zero particle we've ever seen. So we've never seen one before. So the, the central question is how point-like is it really? And the picture that we're going to get from the LHC, um, even if we get a lot more data, the picture we're going to get from the LHC will not tell us convincingly whether uh, the Higgs is much more elementary seeming than the pion. The issue of whether a particle is elementary or not is not, some, uh, is not a hard and fast one. It's a question of whether it appears point-like on distances short compared to its natural Compton wavelength. And what, what we know from the pion is that the, the, the Compton wavelength of the pion is around 1 over 130 MeV. And there's a bit of a, you know, the factor of maybe five shorter distances where we finally saw the substructure associated with the pion, let's say associated with excitations like the Romazon. That ratio is about what we'll have. That's about the resolution we'll have on the Higgs from the, uh, from the LHC. And clearly, in the case of the pion, the world didn't end that we had a roughly uh, uh, elementary particle. It was finally seen to be composite. Well, we won't know whether the Higgs is like that or more elementary than that. So we'll have to put it under a microscope and see if it's more elementary than that. The first question is if it looks more, uh, more elementary than that to external probes. So for instance, you'd like to see whether it literally looks more point-like by how it couples to two photons, or how it couples to two Z particles, and so on. And that's what a Higgs factory will do. The Higgs factory will let us improve this resolution on the Higgs by roughly a factor of 10 relative to what we'll see from the LHC. And so it'll tell us by that factor of 10 uh, for sure whether it's like a pion, or if it's not, that it's definitely not like a pion. It is most certainly not like anything we've seen before. So that's what, uh, that's, that's, to my mind, the, the, the main thing we'll learn from the, uh, from the Higgs factory. And we might also like to know uh, whether the Higgs looks point-like to itself. And uh, to do that, we have to see this famous triple interaction between the uh, Higgs particle. Um, we'll, we'll, we might get some indication whether this coupling even exists at the LHC. But the 100 TV collider will not only tell us if it's there, but will measure it to about 5% 5, 5 accuracy. So you want to know whether the Higgs looks point-like to other things, you'll learn that from a Higgs factory. You want to know most fundamentally whether the Higgs looks point-like to itself, uh, you, you'll learn that at a 100 TV collider. And it's remarkable, I don't have time to go through this, it's remarkable that in fact the Higgs is unique in being the only elementary particle that can actually enjoy the simplest possible interaction in nature. The only elementary particle which can uh, enjoy the, the interaction of a single particle uh, with three of them meeting at a point in space-time. We have those kind of interactions elsewhere in nature, but always some quantum number changes. Some color or flavor or spin quantum number changes. The only particle that is allowed to have this as its dominant interaction is the Higgs. So not only would we see that the Higgs looks point-like to itself, we'd also see the cleanest, most simple fundamental interaction uh, in nature, a prospect that certainly gets me very excited every time I think about it. And of course, also a 100 TV collider will blast into the high energy frontier, uh, will have access to new particles around 10 times heavier than what we can reach at the LHC, and uh, theoretically, very importantly, will probe these violent quantum mechanical fluctuations by the square of that amount with a power around 100 times what we get at the LHC. All right, so the challenge for experiment is totally clear. Um, just put the Higgs under a microscope, study it to death. That's completely obvious. You see a particle you've never seen before, you don't just walk away and shrug. You have to understand everything you possibly can about it. Um, uh, the challenge for theory is deeper than it has been for 40 years. These pe uh, people have been thinking for 40 years about the origin of the cosmological constant and the Higgs mass. The problems have not been solved the way people imagined before, which means that they just got harder, not easier, but they got harder and more profound. Uh, and it's something that we need to be uh, thinking about with more radical ideas. Anyway, I don't have time to talk about uh, 
dark matter and a few of the other things, let me just end. Um, I've said already a number of times, it's not just my own view, um, but certainly it's my view that the scientific issues that we face today are the most difficult and profound ones that fundamental physics has, uh, has faced since the revolutions of relativity and quantum mechanics. I profoundly, I deeply believe this. Uh, and uh, the questions that are raised by these two giant experimental discoveries of our, of our generation, the accelerating universe and the Higgs, they both go to the heart of our understanding of the nature of space-time, quantum mechanics, and the vacuum. And our friends in astronomy are, are, are think it's extremely important to go out and measure everything they can about the expansion of the universe in order to, uh, to, to, to learn more about this mysterious uh, vacuum energy to see, is it really a vacuum energy? Is it something else? Uh, you actually have to go and look at it carefully. And the Higgs gives us a much richer experimental program with many other handles, which is the sort of particle physics avatar of exactly the same set of issues in uh, cosmology. So certainly, uh, I'll reiterate again that from my point of view, the most critical experimental program uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future in fundamental physics is the one that you're all uh, doing much more than I am to make, make a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> We, we have time for one or two questions. Maybe I have one. You have not said much about gravity itself. You, you, don't, you have not commented much about the gravity and the spin two. Yeah, well, I, I, as I said, um, we, we've had these indications for, for decades that there is something different about gravity. And that something different means that this whole picture of the, of the, uh, of the separation of scales between very short distances, you know, there's this idea that whatever's going on at super duper short distances can't really affect the world at long distances a lot, other than through setting the values of parameters like the electric charge or the mass of the electron or something like that. And other than that, the details of what's going on at very high energies are not particularly important. Uh, that's, uh, that's sort of hardwired into the, into the standard quantum field theorist picture of the world. And uh, we've had all these indications for a long time because of gravity, there was something wrong with that worldview, right? Um, still, I think most people thought that, uh, that that's, that's, that's to do with gravity. It's very far away. It's, uh, you know, it, 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 it's interesting for a different kind of talk and a different kind of audience and a different kind of question. But these practical issues about particle physics are not going to be infected by that. You know, this is something for the 30th, for the year 3000, when we have these Planck scale colliders. The incredible thing is that uh, we're now seeing something that's more similar between the story of the Higgs and the cosmological concept. As I said, had we seen any of these things that people were expecting for 40 years, um, had we seen supersymmetric particles, had we seen strong dynamics, had we seen any of these things that had been expected, that would actually that would justify this attitude that, well, these are different problems. There's something going on with gravity that's deep to do with the breakdown of reductionism, blah, blah, blah. And, but there's these other more straight, straightforward things, and we're more or less on, on the right track with them. Um, instead, what we're seeing is that, is that the, the Higgs is refusing to be treated in the way that theorists wanted it to be treated by ignoring all these other problems. And there's actually the, the beginning of strong indications that they're more similar to each other. Um, that's actually profound. That's, that's very important for, for the theorists. It's very confusing for the theorists. I mean, I, I have to say that, uh, that I had this one, one slide about it, that the challenge that's posed by by seeing the Higgs and not seeing anything else makes these problems, they didn't go away, they just became much harder, okay? And if I was a 25-year-old graduate student, I would be licking my lips because I would say, that's great, I don't have to read any of these stupid papers that these guys wrote for 40 years and now I get to uh, try to come up with some really radical uh, new idea. And that's what's needed. What's needed is some kind of radical new idea to attack these problems. That's what theorists have to do. That's difficult to legislate. That's difficult to get up and have conferences and meetings about have radical idea. Great, right? But you have to, you have to do it. It's not so obvious. Uh, but to the experimentalist, it's completely obvious what to do. You just take the Higgs, you put it under a much more powerful microscope, and you see what the heck is going on. You do not walk away from this crazy new phenomenon you've never seen anywhere else in physics just because it's simple. You see, the argument that, oh, we've seen the Higgs, oh, it's boring, we knew about it for 50 years already, is just totally dumb 
because its very simplicity is what's so surprising about it. Okay? So the fact that it's just one thing is actually the entire point. It's very surprising. It's mysterious. You have to look at it and see what it's actually doing. Okay, thank you. I think it's a very good transition for the next talk. So thank you again. Thank you. And